Um, as we know, as you probably know, the event booked out in about six hours for the first tickets and then the second lot of tickets booked out too. So we can see that clearly there's uh, more interest than ever and a real demand to um, up the amount of local food we're growing. Increasing challenges from climate change, biodiversity decline, and as we've seen with things like the coronavirus, the supply chain is fragile. So as an amateur grower myself, um, there's more reason than ever for us to skill up, isn't there? Rather than just being able to grow one or two beetroots, we really would, a lot of us would like to know how to grow vegetables at scale effectively. So we have um, five superb presentations this evening. I'm going to be quite tight on timing, so I'll just carry on. Uh, it's, this event is funded um, very generously by Renew Wales and co-hosted by Transition Brogue Wine, Paramithi Sabenvo, the Permaculture Group, uh, good old Transition Brogine and um, Fanoni Community Resilience, who are a newish group, who, and I'll tell you a bit about those after the speakers. So just a few uh, Zoom things, um, you're probably aware of most of them now. Uh, if you can, looks like you all are, but if you keep your mute on, which is down the bottom left hand side, and um, I've actually got one of the speakers ringing me right now, so that's a bit confusing. Um, the video, if you're finding a problem with video quality, obviously press stop video, which is down in the bottom left corner. You'll see up in the right hand corner where it says view, I'm reliably informed that if you put it on speaker view, that also helps your bandwidth and you can, you'll hear and see the video uh, better. Um, down there in the bottom of the screen is the chat function, which probably everyone is also familiar with by now. That means you can uh, talk amongst yourselves or make jokes, whatever you like. And also on the chat, I have put all of the contact information for the speakers and um, for the host groups, which we will say a bit more about that stuff. So if you could put your um, microphone on mute so we don't hear your um, comments by accident across the uh, speakers. And we're gonna start off with um, um, Steve. Steve Wilson is born and bred Pembrokeshire man. And he's got a background in natural building and organic growing for 30 years. And he regularly runs courses and workshops. And he's gonna start us off with hot composting because as we all appreciate, uh, good soil is the foundation of um, healthy vegetable crop. And so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Steve. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, right, let me start my little timer. So I've got 20 minutes and I'm going to keep to that. Uh, so I mustn't uh, digress or go down any uh, rabbit holes. So I'm going to focus on hot composting. Um, there are two. Uh, oh, have I got my. Uh, no. Sorry, just a moment. Can you share the screen now? Please. And you want to stop the video now? Yes, please. Yeah. We're going to stop the video now, folks. So Steve's going to disappear while he's talking and we'll share that okay okay is that on? Yeah. so there we are so th that's the first shot we have a, a, a lovely image there of, uh, oh where are we going we have an image there of compost uh dark but um, crumbly material um, and this is this is what this talk is about it's there are two principal types of composting aerobic and anaerobic anaerobic without oxygen aerobic with uh, and we're going to be looking at aerobic uh, decomposition of organic matter um, and of aerobic um, composting methods there are two principal ones that most of us will be familiar with the first is uh, most people cold compost in their plastic uh, compost bins um, or this hot composting. Uh, I'm going to be, like I say, talking about hot composting. Um, now, in a nutshell, uh, in about a minute, I'm going to uh, essentially summarize up uh, exactly what you need, what ingredients you need to make a hot compost successful, and then I'll go over the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll go into more detail about each of those ingredients. So from this uh, little drawing I've done here, 
you'll see that um, you need a combination of uh, brown uh, woody type material and I've put some examples there like cardboard leaves straw etc which is your carbony material uh, you need to combine that with green material grass peelings uh, leaves and plants and so on so that's nitrogen rich um, you need water you need air you need microorganisms you need to combine all of these ingredients in the right proportions and you also need mass so you need a lump of material combined um, and if you get these ingredients right uh, you'll get a reaction you'll get a hot compost so in a nutshell that's hot composting uh, I'll go into more detail. Here you see a compost pile. Uh, it, it, this is, uh, you can see this, it's driving off, off moisture and uh, what you can't see is carbon dioxide, but you can certainly see the moisture, which is the heat. So it's steaming away. Um, it's already started to break down uh, the material. So a lot of the material isn't particularly recognizable anymore and it's gone darker in color. Um, so it's heated up and broken down the material and uh, here you see a um, classic compost heap steaming away there. Um, the said co um, uh, compost heaps will um, get up to substantial temperatures uh, and I'll go into more detail on that. You can see this guy, I took this off the internet, he's a very happy chap because he's, um, he's managed to uh, use a hose which he's wrapped, uh, created a coil inside a freshly built compost heap and as he as the compost heap has reacted and is heated up to say 65 and 70 degrees uh, the water in the coil has uh, warmed up and he's, uh, he, he's he's allowed the water to um, flow and he's got hot water from that so that's just an illustration that you can actually get quite hot water from this process this is a classic uh, illustration of composting. Uh, so here you have essentially a profile of a compost heap uh, and you have nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, etc. in layers. This is a, a, a received way of building up a compost heap so that you combine both carbon, which is woody material, and then the green nitrogen rich material. Personally, I don't build it up in layers like that. I tend to um, build up the quantities of material that I need and then I, I do a, a mix, put it all together and uh, create a, a heap or a mass um, and that material is all spread evenly in one big lump. Um, so but what we're looking at as our first breakdown in, in terms of uh, the ingredients, we're going to look at the carbon, uh, oh, why isn't this moving? Sorry. Any reason why that shouldn't be moving? Sorry. Uh, all right, while I'm uh, trying to, it may be just uh, buffering or something, but it's very frustrating that it's not going on to the next image. Um, so what we're looking at next is the carbon-nitrogen ratio, which sounds very technical, but it is, it's essentially the uh, ratio of the carbon rich material to the nitrogen rich material it may be that the images are just buffering because they're quite big yeah. font sizes okay. so here we have a typical classic example of carbon rich material which is the straw on the left um, anything like that which is clearly woody and not green is carbon rich anything which is very green is going to be nitrogen rich and everything is a carbon to nitrogen ratio and ideally what you're looking for is 25 stroke 30 to 1. And you'll see that figure crop up with various materials when it, when it comes to hot composting. You'll see the carbon to nitrogen ratio and it should be 25 stroke 30 to 1. And uh, this is just to recap on what uh, um, the carbon nitrogen ratio uh, on what those individual what those two categories would represent so greens would be vegetable peelings scraps leaves grass cuttings comfrey nettles young weeds coffee grounds and so on the browns um, that you can collect you can save you can keep in bags or you can have straw bales 
when one comes to produce to making one's own hot composting piles you know as an individual what materials you're likely to have access to so some people for instance have large grassy areas which they cut regularly so they'll produce a lot of grass clippings and other people um, may for instance have a source of coffee grounds or nettles or other green material um, so really one has to work out as a compost maker what sort of materials one has uh, right on to the next here's uh, a good uh, carbon to nit nitrogen ratio breakdown and you can see the high the browns the high carbon on your left on the top sorry left is cardboard as i mentioned newspaper uh, peanut shells anything woody sawdust straw wood chips and so on that's high in carbon and greens anything green coffee grounds is down there personally my proximity to town means i can regularly pick up large quantities of coffee grounds and for me that's an important ingredient in my own hot compost here's this is interesting i used to collect compost from a neighbor uh, so i should say ingredients for my compost um, but they always gave it to me uh, so many say maybe every couple of weeks um, and it became it was anaerobic so it was sludgy and smelly and it was a whole family of bacteria that i didn't want to introduce into my compost tea so i had to stop taking it because it was always anaerobic and i don't want anaerobic material in my compost um, you identify anaerobic bacteria because it will smell bad and uh, it will uh, affect the effect it will slow down and um, it, it, it just is just a problem if you're trying to compost aerobically Although I have to say, I did enjoy the half butternut squashes, which every time I got it, there was always a half a butternut squash in there. So, um, but anyway, that's anaerobic and it's not useful. This is the picture I took off the internet. And here you see, um, it's supposed to be the uh, ingredients illustrated, uh, the sort of typical um, ingredients that you put into a compost. I mean, personally, I look at it, I think half that food is edible. But anyway, it, the stuff in the middle is high in nitrogen and the stuff on the outside is high in carbon. So that's the straw. So those are two key ingredients, carbon to nitrogen ratio. I also add other material because the, um, the one good thing about making your own compost is that you can, uh, you can have a, a huge variety of material, um, which will, of course, the more variety you have, um, it's going to improve the quality of the compost. I mean, this is seaweed, which has got a huge number of trace elements. It has um, uh, calcium and a, a high quantity of calcium in it. It's a great, uh, it's locally available to me. So um, I add that to my batches of compost to improve the quality of the um, end product. So this is a quick, uh, I've got nine minutes left. This is a quick illustration here. Um, the, 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 the composting process, once you've got the uh, right ingredients together, you'll, it'll start to heat up. And at different stages of this, comp uh, this um, heating, you'll have the introduction of different groups of bacteria. So there are bacteria that thrive at mesophilic temperatures, that's 21 to 40 degrees or so. They're mesophilic. You get up to thermophilic, so there'll be bacteria that thrive at that temperature. Um, and you'll get up to that temperature, you hold it there, you don't want to get too hot, you don't want to go over 65. So it'll hold at 65, it will kill off weed seeds, which is one of the advantages of hot composting. It will kill off pathogens and it will break down the organic material quicker. So those are key advantages of getting up to the thermophilic stage of hot composting. So there you're really, 65 is where I like to be and no further. Um, this is an illustration of bacteria. You can have between 1 million, one million uh, up to 1 billion individual bacteria in a gram of compost, which gives you some idea of the kind of biological life that's present. And also, uh, and here's a, a, two photographs from my compost heap. Um, on the right at 65, which is just ideal, and I'll hold that for as long as I can. And the longer one holds it, the more the weed seeds, the pathogens, 
and the quicker the organic matter is broken down, um, the, the, the pathogens of weed seeds are killed off. Um, at 75 on the left hand side, it's too high. At that sort of temperature, you need to open the composter up, allow some of the heat out, maybe change the balance of ingredients or add some more carbon rich material, for instance, because at 75, you're killing off some of the key biological life that, um, that, that, that's beneficial and we don't want to, uh, to be frying and, and killing off. Uh, so this year, you can see that white material is actinomycetes. Now, that's a bacteria. It was thought at one stage it was a, a fungal, uh, a, it, it was a fungi, but it isn't. It, but it has very fungi-like um, habits of filaments of long strands. Um, it's a key ingredient in breaking down compost uh, organic material. And incidentally, it's um, responsible for three quarters of our clinical antibiotics. So it's a fascinating material. I haven't got time to go into that now, but it does give compost that distinctive sweet musky smell. Actinomycetes, do look into it because it's a key player in the decomposition of organic matter in our compost heaps. And that's a little picture of it. Then you can see the hyphae, the strands, and, and actinomycetes are really important for breaking down uh, quite stubborn uh, material like lignin or cellulose or chit in the, um, the hard exoskeletons of uh, various uh, micro creature um, uh, beetles and so on. Here's my um, hot compost. You can see the steam. I'm turning it. So that's another one of the ingredients is adequate moisture. Uh, sorry, adequate air, oxygen. The oxygen um, helps the carbon to oxidize it is a, an essential form of energy for the microorganisms like bacteria to reproduce and the nitrogen component in the compost is used to, to synthesize uh, into proteins to build cells so that though those are those um, carbon for energy and nitrogen to synthesize prote proteins um, and here is a little picture of my allotment uh, compost seed. The, the one on the right is underway. The one on the left is complete and is maturing because once the compost has been broken down into a dark crumbly material, um, it's important to leave it mature because things like worms and other detritivores like uh, wood lice and so on, springtails, uh, a whole range of small creatures uh, will move in and start to um, carry out the next process, the maturation of the compost, which is critical, particularly worms, because the, the compost pass, passes through the gut of worms and it's a very different product when it comes out the other end. Again, I haven't got time to go into that. This is a, a rather um, expensive and groovy bit of material for measuring the moisture, but most of us compost makers don't need it. We just use our hands and our, our practiced hand and eye. Um, that's uh, got just about the right sort of moisture content. It's holding together, but it's not um, slimy and horrible. Um, and these are, that's a little illustration of some of the um, uh, detritivores I mentioned, centipedes, uh, uh, ants, uh, beetles, all sorts of creatures that will break it down into the, you know, as the material is maturing, they will be breaking it down still further and making it a more complex material. I must mention that um, humus and compost, I can only drop these things in because I don't have time to go into them, but humus and compost are not the same thing. Humus is only, a good compost will only contain about 5% of humus. Humus being humic uh, substances, so that's humic acid, fulvic acid, and humin, which is like a spongy material. Uh, I'll touch on that, but I would encourage you to look into it, humic substances or humus, um, because that's a key ingredient of good compost um, and it will ultimately feed your soil. You can see in this picture on the top, the little yellow dots, they are worm cocoons. So this material is being broken further down by worms um, and particularly the, the uh, brandling, which um, many of us will be familiar with, the little red uh, worms, tiger worms. This is uh, a, um, something to be mindful of. If you see weed, 
artifact material from other um, sources, be wary of the amount of plastic that exists within um, what looks like to be organic material, but actually turns out to have a lot of plastic in. So that's just a little photo of that. Compost base, I've got two and a half minutes. Compost base, um, I think these are ideal for cold composting. For hot composting, I can't make them work. Um, I'm sure other people do. Uh, you can use them to store material. So once you've got enough woody material and you know you're going to have a glut of nitrogenous material, you know you've got um, your, your calm stuff in store and then you can put it all together and you can make up a batch. Um, this is a very successful system. Uh, it, you, um, one could look into that more. I haven't got time to talk too much about it, I'm afraid. This is a um, hot composting system, another one which is off the shelf, but you really don't need those things. This, this, um, this was a handmade uh, uh, compost tower almost. It was quite a, a big device made by a chap called Joe um, Carey, in, based in Sweden. I visited him out in Sweden and he makes compost teas. He's a tree surgeon and fee, feeds ailing trees in parklands in Stockholm. Um, and you can see that's his device there. The one thing that comes out of that is he's created a chamber on the outside which provides oxygen to the material and that's the compost that he makes. So that's another example of a compost bay but most people are more used to this like our friend Monty out of pallets, that's the system I use. Um, this is one on the local allotments. Uh, subsequently lined with plastic, which I don't recommend. As we mentioned, oxygen is really important. You really need about 5% oxygen in your compost heap. Uh, and that's what you get at the end. A black, rich material, rich in humic, acid, uh, humic substances. So up to about 5% in humic substances for a good compost. Full of um, worm, uh, eggs and other biological life, which is essential. And then it is black and lovely onto the compost. Um, and that's top dressing there on. So as soon as you can see on the right hand side is the actual compost bay and it goes from there and it top dresses onto the soil and then the worms and so on, bring the material down into the earth. And else ultimately that's what it's all about is producing healthy plants like that. Um, I just want to conclude, I've only got 20 seconds, to say that the key ingredients are carbon to nitrogen, if you get familiar with that, be aware that it, um, aerobic composition needs oxygen, you need enough moist, adequate moisture, you need to be able to turn it so that what's on the outside goes on the inside, and that's my timer up. Um, and I think I have to conclude there in order to uh, keep with my to keep with the schedule. I'm sorry if I had to rush that. I hope it was uh, covered the ground that we needed to. And I'll hand you back to Jasmine. Thank you, Steve. Um, that's brilliant. And I'm sorry that we had to uh, squash, uh, squash you into the, such a short time. Let's give him a, a round of applause, a silent one from uh, room, Zoom rooms. Um, I've got one quick question from you from the chat. Yes. Okay. What is the differences in constructing a pile for water heating, given the difficulty in turning or augmenting once underway? Do you want to say yeah. something briefly about that? Yeah, I mean, really, that's a bit of a, a fun, really, what the guy did with that. Um, you, you couldn't, if you're referring to the guy with the uh, hose pipe with the water in it, yeah, yeah that's, that's just a bit of fun, really. I, I okay. don't think he would do much more than have a good photo and... A good experience and a bit of fun doing it that's all yeah what well, what's that um old book who's the guy that they he was quite an old book and he was french and he had big compost with pipes through them do you remember the name oh gosh i don't know that no, no. anyway that's um that's got a lot of stuff about using the water pipes in it if i remember the name of the book while we're on or if anyone else yeah. does put it in the it chat is, it is doable it's just a convoluted and quite a committed process really for a ordinary folk so yeah, yeah. Okay, well, Dioc, Steve, that was okay, a very interesting, up. even though I was doing lots of other stuff at the same time. So, look, if uh, Steve does run, uh, do lots of talks, runs training, um, he's, you know, an expert in fruit tree grafting, orchards, starting native meadows, um, you've seen his hot composting, and also natural building. So if you are interested in 
catching Steve for uh, more information or for his longer presentation on that, um, you can email him. And if you go up to the top of the chat, the details are there on how to get hold of Steve. Or, um, you know, if you really can't save the chat, then obviously connect, contact me or Renew Wales. Okay, cheers, Steve. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. So, next up, we've got Malcolm, who is um, also known as the dreaded gardener because he's, he's terribly frightening. And um, he's been a professional fruit and, <laughs> fruit and veg grower for over 20 years, um, including at the National Botanical Garden. He teaches RHS courses, leads a volunteer group at Denmark Farm, and is founding director of the Havod Wald Garden. So he gives lots of talks and he's got an amazing Facebook feed. So he's going to explain to us about how to grow food well while putting nature first. So are you ready to go, Mal? Indeed I am, Jasmine. Many thanks. Lovely. Thank you. And uh, good evening to everyone. Um, so yes, my, uh, my main interest uh, in many ways is with the biodiversity side of things. Um, there's a lot of um, attitudes of mine from coming from a good gardener sort of point of view that I've adjusted um, because for me nature has to come first in all that I do. Um, I am happy to inconvenience myself and make my working harder with more effort uh, if nature I see as being the beneficiary. Um, one aspect of this is I've redefined what I understand as the aesthetic in the garden. Um, for me if nature is benefiting then that is beautiful. Um, some might regard it as a mess, but there's a lot of practices within professional horticulture um, that I see as actually quite damaging in terms of nature. Um, so I'm trying not to use those myself. Um, in terms of edge growing, one of the things that I find um, uh, I, I take the view of is uh, there's a lot these days about maximizing yield and crop the hell out of your plot. Um, but that's not my view at all. I think as long as I get enough, then that's enough, isn't it? Surely. Um, so anything else comes into overproduction from my point of view. Um, with, uh, with, setting a, with setting yourselves up in terms of seeds, um, one thing I would say with that is to always grow open pollinated varieties. Um, in general, F1 hybrids are what gets pushed onto the home grower, um, but these were developed for large scale agriculture um, because in general, they ripen in a very small window, which when we are home gardening is the last thing we want because then we just end up with massive gluts that we don't know what to do with. So the open pollinated ones, they will produce crops over a longer period. Um, so they will keep, and generally they can, uh, some of them can potentially uh, have a higher yield overall uh, over an F1 hybrid. Um, other advantages with open pollinated, um, as well as maintaining the general genetic diversity uh, that's around in the plants, the seed can be home saved. Um, there's constant moves to try and make this illegal, um, which would be absolutely horrendous if it ever succeeded. Um, so hopefully it won't. Um, a couple of good sources as well that I use quite a lot are Real Seeds, who are based in Newport in Pems. Um, it's uh, it's very close to uh, the you know it's the very similar conditions to what most of us probably experience. Um, so then it had a, it's a good quality seed in the first place, and it's acclimatised to these conditions, which is also useful. Um, another one I use quite a lot is the Seed Cooperative. Um, these are currently based in um, Lincolnshire, they're developing a site there. Uh, it is something that you can buy shares in as well and be a part of. Um, it is being done as a proper cooperative. Uh, in many cases it's, it's all organic and it's, uh, uh, much of it is biodynamically grown seed as well. Um, so it, uh, it's very good quality uh, and uh, I, I like to support them. Um, one of the ways that uh, when I'm setting out my vegetables, the way I like to grow uh, is using a system called polyculture. Um, for me, it's a more creative way to grow. Mixing crops together is far more naturalistic uh, as a planting style, mixing in with flowers. Uh, but I won't go into that too much because uh, Kim will say a bit about that later on. Um, so for me, working in the garden, 
let me find there we go. Second, they come. There we go. Um, working in the garden uh, in terms of maintaining my crops and how I get them established, uh, weeds is always a, a big issue. Um, this is why people think wildlife gardens and such are messy because it's weeds, it's weeds. Um, but it's not, it's habitat and it's not all the time. Um, because in the first place, I clear all my beds. Um, I like, I find it easier with polyculture to have something of a blank canvas to play with. So I like to um, clear all the ground that I grow in, first of all, uh, and then I work out where some things go and in around them. So I give it a good clear out in the spring. Um, and I, as the crops are establishing, I will keep them weeded um, to keep them growing well. But once the year turns to August, somewhere in early August, uh, I just stop weeding. I've generally had enough by then anyway. Um, uh, so over winter, uh, my ground will generally look like this, a mixture of weeds and in many cases crop debris, um, the browner material lying on the top of peas, uh, an old crop of. Um, it is one of those things that we like to see things like bare soil. That's the aesthetic point of view. Um, but it's very bad for your soil to have it bare over winter. Uh, you can lose too much nutrient from it being leached away by winter rains. Uh, and also uh, the winter rain can damage the soil structure. So it's always best to have it covered. And this is the solution that I've come up with. Um, it could be seen as quite high maintenance, but again, nature's benefiting because all through the winter, uh, through these areas, uh, invertebrates can still keep moving, everything can keep going, it's lots of shelter and protection, uh, which is really useful for much biodiversity indeed. Um, and then as you see back in the spring, I'll, I'll clear it back out completely uh, and have the blank canvas once more. Um, so further, um, oh that's the other thing with that, um, I find by leaving them in August, it gives them long enough to uh, the weeds long enough to germinate and establish and many of those plants will then be flowering in about January or February and into March um, which is around the point I'll be starting to clear through but uh, it does make other nectar sources available quite early on um, because even in a warm day in winter you'll get lots of flies and different things flying around and they, they need food of some sort um, so I don't see these as weeds anymore I see them as valuable late winter flowerers um, I've just changed my attitude on that, and I, this is this is doesn't look a mess to me. This is this is beautiful because nature's benefiting from it. Uh, so the other thing uh, to as a concept to play with is dynamic stability, um, and this is somewhat sounding contradictory, uh, but it's just the natural order where the predators are in balance with the pests that they deal with. So it, there's so much life in there that uh, it just everything keeps it all else in check. So then you don't really have to do a lot of pest control, I find, because the system, you know, it, it's there and it does work. Um, these days, it's, it is very much out of kilter, uh, mostly through pesticide use, because when we, whenever we kill a pest, all we're doing is destroying a food source for something else. So it's very important to try and maintain this natural order or, or, or develop it back. So you've, you've got to give, to start bringing it back, you've got to give nature its head to a certain extent. Um, but once you do that, then the system has a chance to start re-establishing. Um, because an awful lot gets spoken about uh, regarding pollinators, and these are very much a, a vital aspect. Um, but it does actually exclude quite a lot of biodiversity. Uh, there's a lot that uh, we can pay attention to outside of the pollinators. Um, and my general view is that uh, I, use, I try to use sacrificial plants. Um, so we give the pests somewhere to be that isn't a problem. Um, uh, I've, I think it's got to the point now where it's not enough just to tolerate pests. We have to actively encourage them in. But by giving them somewhere to be that's not a problem, they can be the food source they're meant to be. Uh, and then everything else will start increasing uh, once they start eating that. Uh, so a few examples I've got around that. 
Um, that's something that uh, usually revulses most people uh, and they generally wouldn't tolerate it. Uh, that's actually a kale plant flowering. Um, and this was an early success I had. I still have my old gardener's head on to a degree, but I let this kale plant flower because it wasn't in the way. Uh, and then the cabbage grey aphid absolutely turned up en masse and I nearly ripped it out, but I managed to just check myself in time and thought, you don't learn anything unless you observe what goes on. So I left them there and they did not prove to be a reservoir of infection for my newly planted brassicas. Uh, this material is so soft and sappy, they were quite happy just to stay there. Um, but once you've got somewhere for them to be, uh, then things like parasitic wasps can find them. Uh, if you can see the, the brown swollen uh, parts on that stem, they are aphids that have, a parasitic wasp has come along, laid an egg inside the aphid, and then that's like eaten the aphid from the inside out. Uh, and there's a couple there, you can even see a hole in the back, which is where the new adult wasp has emerged. So uh, just by leaving them there, that helps to support those wasps and increase their numbers to keep the aphids better in check. Uh, if you leave them as well, this is a hoverfly larvae in process of eating uh, an aphid. Uh, and you can see around it, most of it is just empty skins. So it's, it's had a little while there and had a, quite a feast by the look of things. Um, these are a, another lovely one. Uh, it's a, uh, they, they're not exactly parasitic. Um, they just swim around in the caterpillar's bloodstream. Um, but these are a, a wonderful um, parasitoid wasp uh, that purely attacks the um, uh, large white butterfly caterpillars. And with um, parasitic wasps in general, there are around 6,000 species in the UK alone. Um, and globally, there is a, a parasitic wasp that will deal with every single pest insect on earth. So I think it's far better to try and create the conditions that encourage these rather than using chemical sprays and those sorts of things. Um, because uh, I always try to grow a, a, an area of nasturtiums, so if I see a whole load of caterpillars uh, just hatched out, I might break the leaf off the brassica and go and stick it in the nasturtiums, and they can eat those quite happily. I really don't care. That's my sacrificial plant for those. And then they can be the food source for birds or for the, uh, for the wasp to get stuck into. Um, but if I just kill them, that's food, lots of food sources gone again. So it's... And you, it's trying to find the solution of where you can put things that isn't a problem to you. And then biodiversity just keeps on increasing. Um, common wasps always get a bad press, but here's one taking a, a small white cabbage caterpillar uh, off of my sprouting broccoli. Um, so I'm quite happy to have wasps around. They, uh, they do a lot of good pest control for us. Uh, they, they seem to be one of the main pollinators for bramble, I seem to find. You often find wasps on bramble, uh, but they do good pest control for us. Uh, this is um, the larvae of the parsnip moth. Uh, one thing I do is grow parsnips for seed. Um, so I have my own parsnip, uh, my own homegrown parsnip seed. Uh, but unfortunately, the parsnip moth larvae will go into the parsnip heads uh, in, in the flower stage or in the seed stage, pull a whole load together and then just start chewing away. Uh, this one is actually on hogweed, uh, which I do have in my garden. Uh, and now I want more of, because I know now it's uh, a decoy plant, a sacrificial plant for the parsnip moth. Um, so they can chew that away quite happily and I'm not fussed at all. My parsnip seed crop is fine. Um, yeah, down in, the, down in the grass, there's a whole lot of things happening down there as well. This was a, an ant dragging a, a young earwig back to the nest for be, uh, food, I assume. Um, so I, uh, when I'm cutting my small amount of grass areas, uh, I just have a, a push along cylinder mower. I don't have a power mower of any sort, uh, which would just cause an absolute mess for everything that's down below in the grass. Uh, with a lot, that's a lot of the time using that I can go across the top of dandelions and daisies and things that are flowering uh, and just not touch them at all. Um, uh, it will take some of the heads off but some will remain. So it's a far more gentle way uh, of dealing with the grass. 
so that this whole community that's down there, again, doing lots of good pest control work uh, in the main, can carry on. Uh, another one I find is this is the ashy mining bee uh, that I spotted once uh, in one of my grass areas. So again, using a power mower at the wrong time for this, that could be absolutely disastrous. But using a push along cylinder mower, um, it's not a problem for them whatsoever. And I can just go straight over the top of them. Um, so in terms of a sort of bigger picture, uh, I really, for in terms of the biodiversity, I take a very sort of whole garden approach. Uh, I find that trying to get as many different types of habitat in the garden as possible. Um, a lot of these will uh, take um, very unique plants that can grow in them, for instance, a pond. Uh, with the, so you've got an aquatic range of plants you can grow uh, in there, uh, as well as it being such a good place for breeding up more biodiversity in general. Uh, as are things like meadows, even on a very small scale, uh, are very valid things to have. Mine has an awful lot of life in it. Um, but other hedges and all sorts of things, log, log piles and stone piles often disregarded, uh, but very important. A number of beetle species, uh, their larvae spend that stage in rotting wood uh, and dry stone walls can also be useful. Um, but generally correctly managed then, um, it should provide food for both adults and young. Uh, of whatever you're after. Uh, it will provide water, shelter, hibernation and breeding sites uh, and these are some of the very key things that we need to supply for biodiversity in general to support as much of it as we can. And ultimately the bigger picture uh, is that one there. Uh, this is one we always have to bear in mind. Um, I never see it as just me tickling about in my garden. I'm, I'm tickling about on this place here. Um, so my footprint has to be a bit gentle in what I'm doing as much as possible. Um, I see that we're not, we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. Uh, and part of the, the main part of why we're here on this lovely place is to look after it, not just for ourselves, not just for our own benefit, uh, but for the benefit of everything that we share it with as well. So I hope that's given you some good information. That's me done and I shall hand back to Jasmine. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm gonna have interesting dreams tonight of insects. So we'll give you our silent round of applause. Um, most of us are happy. And um, if you want to uh, see more of Malcolm or even maybe hire him or something for a talk, but particularly I noticed your Facebook feed, it's uh, really, really informative. It's full of beautiful pictures. So they, people can find him on, under the Dreaded Gardener on Facebook. And I just reposted in the chat um, the contact details of all the speakers. So thank you very much. Well, with the um, Havod Walled Garden group as well on um, Facebook. Yeah, good. Yeah, we've got a separate one and we have a website as well. So. Cool. Okay, so the Havod Walled Garden Group and, um, and through the Dreaded Gardener. Thank you. It's, um, it's hard to listen to the talks when you're facilitating because um, the technology just keeps collapsing. So you're just <laughs> obsessed with that. Okay, so next up then. Um, ah, so they've got questions for you, Malcolm, in the chat. What pests eat slugs? So next up is um, Kim Stoddart that we're very pleased to have. She's um, got many hats. So she's a gardening journal a journalist, a gardening journalist for The Guardian and also for Country Smallholder magazine, uh, editor of The Organic Way. And she's got a new book called The Climate Change Garden. Yeah, she runs courses at her small holding in Keradigion. And uh, she's got a very good Twitter feed and Facebook feed that I've also put in the chat there. And um, Kim's going to speak to us about how to actually cope with uh, the erratic conditions we're seeing with um, increasingly in our weather and with climate change and um, talk to us about how to be a climate change savvy gardener. So um, fingers crossed, everything works. Over to you, Kim. Thank you very much, Jasmine, and thank you, everyone else. Um, I'm using my mobile phone this evening, so we're going to improvise with the IT site. Ah, so hands up if you've now lost being able to hear Kim. Oh, we can't hear you, Kim. 
mm. until recently in Brexit and everything else. So I'm going to go through the, um, the doom and gloom first, as I call it, and then look at offering practical solutions. But I want to just set the scene first. Um, so climate change, um, obviously it's happening. I don't have to explain to people anymore or try and convince them that it's happening when I do talks. Um, greater extremes of weather. Um, this year alone, we've had the, um, the warmest, uh, the wettest uh, February on record, um, followed by the warmest spring. Um, and then we've had a very, very erratic condition since then. Back in July, it felt like it was autumn. Um, and now we're potentially having another heat wave again. So on the ground, um, it leaves many of our current practices very vulnerable, um, especially when you're trying to control nature and keep it in its place. Uh, there's greater risk of pests and disease as well. Um, and effectively, it's no longer gardening as usual. So what happens is um, your plants get caught out by the weather. So even if they don't immediately show some sort of impact um, to the drought or the extreme wind, rain, whatever it might be, um, they can suffer stress and then we get another weather front moving in that can cause damage. Some varieties struggle so um, Malcolm talking about seed saving it is so important and such an empowering amazing amazing thing to do highly recommended um, because what you're doing is you're creating varieties much more adapted to your own individual plot so um, very much recommended. Um, it can be too wet to harvest winter crops and soil erosion is also a massive thing. So again, I'm going to look at that quite a lot today as we're sort of edging into autumn winter, although the sun is currently shining. Um, and also the time and effort to actually protect your plants uh, and the watering. But homegrown is more important than ever. So I'm just going to move the, the phone over slightly here so you can see a nice image of some produce. Um, so I should actually mention as well, if anybody wants it, I do have a copy of this presentation available afterwards. Um, so you're welcome to, to get a copy of that. So um, homegrown is more important than before. Um, there are issues around food security, well-being. It makes you feel amazing during lockdown. You know, just being able to, to nurture a seed into a plant, into food that you can eat is amazing for your well-being and with all the disconnect we have with mask wearing and everything else that you know the current situation that is necessary that we find ourselves in there are massive issues around mental health so all these this heady concoction of things that are going on right now the more that you can get involved and grow your own food the better that is it's nurturing it's empowering it's mesmerizing um you know nurturing food that you can put on the table and eat it's really important and you know naturally we're hunter gatherers so the connection to have that connection with our food is actually I believe it's within all of us um, to not have it is actually it's missing out on so much that's so important but the good news she says moving the screen again is as Malcolm said um, nature holds a lot of the answers um, so good excuse there for a nice picture of a frog um, and organic gardening. Organic gardening is absolutely the way, working in tune with nature. The problem is, um, where we are now, is that a lot of our current practices are based, based on Victorian country house practices of gardening. So it's all about controlling nature, keeping nature in its place, pulling out every weed, being all very meticulous. But by doing so, as Malcolm's talking about, what you're doing is you're actually um, you're fighting nature. And you're also, you're making more work for yourself, your space is needier if you're using fertilizers, and ultimately it's more vulnerable to the elements. So actually, if you look back before Victorian, um, you know, control nature sort of standards, actually the um, medieval peasant gardens, um, of which is a really good example at St Faggins in Cardiff, um, they used to work absolutely with nature. They used to seed save, they allowed weeds to grow like fat hen because it's edible. A lot of weeds, um, so you check this first, but a lot of weeds actually do have a lot of uses. They attract pollinators. There's just a much greater biodiversity in the gardening space, which makes it much easier for you um, and less work for you. And it's again, keeping things in balance. So, um, you know, when you're trying to control something so meticulously, almost like it's an extra room in your house what that means is you're actually making extra work for yourself and um, who wants that really um, working with um, with wildlife just feels absolutely fantastic and it's so good for you so my climate change gardens in west wales um, flooded um, it's about seven eight years ago and as a result i researched the whole idea of what you could do to, to produce or to create a more resilient space 
So um, there's lots of ways of going about it. And in the research for my book as well, I researched different methods used around the world. But effectively, it's really not that complicated, the majority of things you can do. Um, from a flooding perspective, as we sort of edge into um, you know, winter, soil erosion, all those risks of, of that sort of season, is looking at slow it, spread it, sink it. Um, with regards to the outside growing space. So often, um, you know, hardcore um, surfaces, water, you get water running off. There's nowhere for the water to go. It's a classic permaculture pit, uh, principle. Slow it, spread it, sink it. You know, don't try and fight the water, work with it. Allow it to move away. Um, so in terms of what to do, um, as Malcolm said, the worst thing you can do over winter um, is to actually dig the soil. You know, this whole idea of tidying up your garden space, let's tide it up, let's, let's pull everything out, um, let's dig it over. But actually, um, your soil is in the organic gardening system, it's the heart and soul of, um, of your growing efforts. So soil erosion is a massive issue over winter. And what happens is that by digging the soil and not protecting it, the nutrients that you spent so long um, dutifully building up, um, to, to help with your plant growing, they effectively get washed away, um, which is obviously not good for anyone. It is a massive, massive issue. So actually, um, you can look at green manures um, to use, but what I actually do, which is much easier than that arguably, is I just try and allow ground cover as much as possible. So even allowing weeds to grow, weeds to grow. And a lot of time there's this mentality of growing something and then just whipping it out the ground. Um, but actually what you should, what I now do, which I highly recommend, is um, either allowing crops to um, basically rot down in situ or letting them flower so it's food for the birds, you know, for example plants like fennel, growing a lot more perennials in itself helps provide soil structure, helps to sort of bind the soil together. If you can imagine there's my demonstration of my hand is, you know, roots in soil. So, but also even allowing some weeds to grow um, will actually will actually work to that effect. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to open the soil up to the elements um, and you certainly don't want to double dig. Um, please nobody double dig. You know, again, these things that we're told we should be doing, it's work generation, it's actually making our gardens a lot more vulnerable. Um, but you know, with um, with crops as well, there's a lot of things you can do to actually help with um, the resilience of that. Looking to older varieties of crops, the seed saving, and also working um, in a space that is literally full of wildlife is is good for the soul. It makes you feel good. Um, another example I had is I, I have a private water supply on my my small holding, my training gardens. And um, back in 2018, with the heat wave, um, which went on for a long period of time, um, my private water supply actually ran almost dry. So um, I wasn't ferrying water backwards and forwards every day um, to water the plants because there, there was no water to do that with. So it actually tested the, um, the techniques that I teach to the limit, which is, you know, is a good thing because, um, you know, it's good to see how far you can go with things. But ultimately, um, what I found is that plants can be a lot more resilient than you think they might be. And there's lots of things that you can do, like using ground cloth cover, wa watering in the right way. So not surface watering, make, sure make sure that the water actually permeates much deeper into the ground. But also um, not um, block planting, which is a massive thing um, that I very much don't do. So, um, you know, my approach is very much free spirited in nature. It's um, like Malcolm, it's very much about working with nature and also just constantly looking at new ways of doing things. And the more you can have the connection, the better for our well-being, especially right now. But the more that you actually look and see. So things like just looking at the soil, putting your hands in the soil and getting connected. You can't any longer just follow the gardening rules verbatim. Um, it's good to actually use your instinct. So seed saving is massively empowering. Things like fixing your tools um, or making something out of old pallets, massively empowering. And as much as possible, um, it's very much a case of, I think, building resilience in the gardener as much as the actual garden, because we're, we're having to deal with a lot right now, let's face it. And the more that you can build resilience in yourself, 
um, and your growing efforts, the better you'll be able to, to deal with this and to think on your feet as well and to actually think on your feet um, and to, to work out new ways of doing things. So um, mixed planting, I'd like to give some time to because it is monumental for me because I used to spend so much time because I've got, you know, my, my gardens are over a large site. It's a 2.3 acre small holding and the gardens are about um, almost half an acre. Um, in size, I've got a forest garden, I've got polytunnels, and I've got lots of um, outside growing area space. So what I did start with, as you're supposed to, as a, as a good gardener, um, is to have um, these meticulous crop rotation plans. And I used to just have, you know, these lists and, you know, again, following it religiously and different people would say different things things, had to follow different systems. Um, and then what happened is I had in one of the polytunnels a, a lovely long row, because you're supposed to grow in rows or blocks, of tomatoes and watched as, as blight moved from tomato to plant to plant to plant and just wiped out the lot despite picking off the leaves and trying different techniques. And that made me think and it made me experiment just off the cuff with um, mixed planting. I didn't know then it was called polyculture. Um, I'd never tried it, but the, the only rule of thumb with this is that you really just want to have plants from the same family. So say, for example, um, tomatoes and potatoes separate from each other, say at least two foot away from each other. And then you can mix and match, mix and match the different types of plants that you have. You can work with different heights and structures. It's a bit like forest gardening in a way because it's replicating much more closely what would happen in nature in nature but it's also um there's a freedom in it so you can think well i like this and i'd like to have i'd like to have that so i like for example bright colored flowers um i like bright colored things in the garden it makes me smile so i have lots of um poppies of different varieties welsh poppy opium poppy that just moved in um aquilegia you know foxglove it's also nitrogen fixing um, and things like geranium, I just have lots of bright colours mixed around the produce, which helps to provide ground cover, keep the water in, and also provide protection over winter. Um, but it's also, like Malcolm was talking about earlier, I don't have an issue with pests. Everything seems much more in balance than it ever did before, but the same goes for disease as well. So it doesn't mean that you're not going to get the odd nibble by, for example, a, a cabbage white um, caterpillar. Um, of course, that's unrealistic to think that that's not going to happen. But if you imagine um, a massive block of carrots, then it's much easier for, say, the carrot fly to actually find that what, what they're looking for. You know, in a way, you might as well put a sign up saying carrot fly come this way. But if you have carrots mixed in with um, various other produce, it's much, much harder for the so-called pest. Um, to find what it's actually looking for and the same goes with disease. I actually did a little test bed this year and I had block planted um, potatoes with potatoes that were just mixed in with different produce. Block planted ones completely got blight because I get blight where I am, um, the others absolutely fine. So it's, um, I highly recommend it. I mean I get people on my courses saying but I, I like, I like straight rows. I mean straight rows aren't actually natural in nature you know nature's full of curves and swells and you know it's much more free-spirited in essence but you know you could always just experiment and just do a sort of maybe a diagonal of, um, of different plants so it's about making it your own and I think that the more you can make gardening your own um, the better that is basically um, and things like so you've got your different types of plants um, if you imagine if you imagine this is a raised bed um, then, you know, a tomato over here, say a cucumber over there. The only thing I do tend to plant together are brassicas um, and legumes. So peas and beans with your, your cabbages and kales and so forth, because um, legumes, peas and beans are nitrogen fixing. And, you know, they often followed in crop rotation system by the brassicas. So by planting them together, I'm actually in a set essence cutting to the chase. With that and I use ground cover like light on the soil plants like lettuce somebody just mentioned mentioned in the comments um, so things like lettuce leaves and rockets they're very light on the soil um, and you can use those as fillers in between the other plants which again ground cover is massively important so I could talk loads more on that but I've only got a few more minutes so um, I'm going to move on one thing I didn't say with mixed planting actually is it's really fun so that's another good reason for doing it um, oh, and plants have symbiotic relationships we don't understand underground. 
So the less disturbance of the ground, the better it is. And if you just pull plants out, you know, the, the whole plant out, often you'll find things like mycrosial fungi on the roots. Why would you want to take that out of the ground? If you just cut it off at the root, then you're leaving that in the ground to the benefit. Um, we don't understand what happens underneath, underground. It's an amazing, miraculous thing. It's just, we're very much at the tip of the iceberg of that understanding. So the more you can leave those things alone, the better that is. And a final idea with this, because um, I'm running out of time, is turning plants perennial. This again, another experiment, often experiments are the best. You can leave um, the likes of kale, shard, purple sprouting broccoli to grow on for um, five or six years. Um, all you have to do is cut them back, allow them to flower because they will attract pollinators in with gusto. Um, it's a great way of getting pollinators onto your plot, but you just cut them back and they will keep on growing and they will be super resilient and hardy. Um, you know, if they get a nibble from a, a, cabbage, a cabbage white um, caterpillar, they just shake it off. It doesn't bother them. Their root structure is so deep under the ground. You don't need to water them either. So massively resilient. Um, so, oh, I think I'm exactly on time, actually. That's quite good for me. Um, yeah, my, I just want to say as well, um, my book is for sale tonight at the discounted rate of £13, if that's okay to mention that. Um, it's normally £16.99, but we can send around a link, um, if that's okay with Jasmine and everyone afterwards. And I've also, um, two courses coming up. I've got two courses next Friday, uh, next Saturday. Um, climate change gardening on the Saturday and polytunnel growing on um, on the Friday and I'm also running courses at Botanic Gardens um, in early October on reducing plastic in the garden and also um, therapeutic gardening but thank you very much um, it's great that you're doing an event like this it's so important to, to discuss these things and offer help where we can Thank you, Kim. A lot of information there. I hope everybody caught it or from all the speakers. Um, you're, the best way to get in contact with you is it's in the chat, but um, through the greenrocketcourses.com. Is that one of the best ways to book on to what you're doing this next week? It is, yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, so if you want to send a link, I don't know, it's up to Renew Wales if they would send that round to the participants list, but I can certainly post it for you on all the host group websites, um, you know, and all the Facebooks and everything. That's great. So, there is um, a couple of the questions, but they did get answered pretty much by the other speakers and so forth. But there is one here from um, Hot Composter. He says, Kim, what about club root on broccoli left over several years? Is that a problem? Does it withstand it? Um, it's an interesting question because um, there are many different views on these things and I, I was privy recently someone that believes that actually brassicas really benefit from being left in situ that actually you know obviously we're, we're told that, that with organic gardening system crop rotation is the way to go if you're a commercial grower it is because you don't want to have to forage around to to harvest carrots um, to put in your weekly veg boxes but you know if you're like me and you're you're growing for your you know for your family and for pleasure and for passing on information then it's um it's it's quite fun actually to go foraging you can sort of don a little forager's hat and go and find your carrots but um no i've never had a problem with that i honestly don't think it's an issue um i think that again with um there's there's lots of ideas around you know you must try things i mean somebody might have a problem on their particular plot in which case vary it but from my experience and people that I've spoken to, you know, I've never, I've not experienced that before. But I think that by, by mixed planting, you are much more closely replicating what's happening in nature. Um, and there are so many ben benefit benefits from doing that. Um, I, yeah, I could just talk about that all evening. Hope that answers right. your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there is so much more to all these topics and um, I don't know, we, you know, we don't know to what extent people know things or not already, but I think that's a brilliant potted top tip presentation there for us. So uh, if anyway, if, assuming everybody knows how to use the chat, there is quite a lot of information coming up there. Um, so it's a middle button down at the bottom of your screen. If you're not familiar with it, click there and you'll get this conversation about vegetables and comments on what the speakers are saying simultaneously. So as an author myself, who doesn't sell many books, I just flag up one more time, the climate change garden book there for Kim Stoddart. Thank you, Bastien. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go on to Tom now. And um, 
Tom is a Renew Wales mentor as well and the grower for Kaitan CSA which is community supported agriculture down in the Gower. Uh, Tom has been growing organic and biodynamic produce in community settings for 20 years and they offer training and a, a you know, number of opportunities down there at their place. So he's going to tell us about something that is really a skill that we not many of us have is how could we scale up um, from garden scale to field scale and be doing it in a climate wise and nature friendly way. So I'm going to turn my ears up a notch um, and I'll hand over to Tom for telling us about uh, scaling up uh, the food we grow. Thanks a lot, Jasmine. So you can, you can actually hear me now, I hope. Yes. Good. I had a bit of problem when I started and the, it wasn't working. I was running around trying to get different computers going, but it's all good now. So um, I've also, because of having computer problems, I've prepared this presentation, which hopefully I, I'm going to just flash up a few things as we go along. So basically from garden to field, scaling up, I'm going to cover very briefly land because I know Lucy Taylor's going to cover that, finding land, and then markets and I'm going to do growers and workers, equipment and basic needs and moving on to what kind of scale and then finances and business plans and then finally business structure. So they can, I'm going to kind of go through all of these fairly briefly because actually we haven't got that much time to do them. Um, and so finding land, I'll just sort of, I don't know how useful this is to see these, but I'll just flash that up. So within finding land, I would say it's basically, a lot of it's about word of mouth. I know for me, when we started, we did a lot of knocking on doors and advertising locally, just talking to lots of people, really. Um, you're going to have to look at kind of how much land do you think you're going to need? which is like fundamental. I don't, people will be starting with different quantities of land. And from my point of view, we're on eight acres and we're grown for 126 households, which basically we've got the equivalent of 85 full shares. And I worked out basically, it means we dedicate 370 square meters per household that we grow for. But we've also got like a lot of scrub land and wetland so we're not using all our land, which is nice, you know, we've got a lot of wild land, we've got mature trees, we've got an acre and a half of like scrub with three big ponds in it. So there's a lot of wildlife. So I'd say you could be looking for anywhere between 250 square metres upwards to supply one household with veg all year round. That's going on how it's working for us. Um, and then assessing land quality. It's like a big thing when I've been sort of looking around at land. The, the, if you're used to digging in soil and like looking at different ki kinds of soil, you can generally just get a spade or a fork, have a bit of a dig around, feel the soil, have a bit of a sniff of what it's like. Does it smell anaerobic? Is it waterlogged? Can you see like glaying in there, which is these little bluey grey patches in the soil, which means that generally the, la the land is going to be waterlogged for part of the year. Um, so basically you're kind of looking for the best, most aerobic, healthy looking soil. And when you look at what's growing on the surface, you know, if there's a lot of stuff growing, a lot of grass, different kinds of wild plants, anything, you know, it's generally going to be, it's probably going to be a good soil. If you've got one monoculture, unless it's like obviously a cultivated monoculture that's been chosen for that land, um, it could be problematic. But if there's a diversity of plants there, it's likely to be, okay soil um and the other thing is you just have a look what's growing next door do you know are there other farmers growing in the area what are they growing how successful are they and then the last thing you can do is do a lab a lab assessment so you could basically go to somewhere like nrm laboratories and basically just see um get a soil test done through them um buying or renting land i'd say Buying land really varies the price of it. At the moment, when I look around, it seems to be like eight to 12,000 an acre, and we're paying 500 an acre rental on the, on the piece of land that we're renting at the moment. Um, so that's just very briefly land. And then I'd say once you've kind of got a potential bit of land, 
or not that this is any particular order. This is your market research. So fundamental, like people talk about doing business plans. And when I first heard about business plans, you know, I was a bit put off. I was a bit like, oh my God, I don't know how to do a business plan. How do you go about that? But it's basically just looking at what you've got, um, what you want to achieve, how likely you just be very realistic about actually what you need to do in order to get where you want to be and you talk to people um you be very honest and you can create a business plan you know around those basic themes so i'd say market research basically go out and talk to people look visit different farms look at different models um, community supported agriculture box schemes selling directly to restaurants cafes shops running market stalls selling wholesale you know there's there's lots of different options there's different ways of going we've chosen going down the community supported agriculture csa route because personally i i found having worked in different areas it's the most reliable income wise and sort of work wise um so yeah i'd say the key thing there is basically just talking to people um, being very realistic. So when you talk to people, say you're going to like a cafe or a restaurant, you know, ask them realistically, how much salad are they going to want to buy each year? How much veg are they going to want to buy each year? How much are they going to be willing to pay? Where do they currently buy things from? How much do they pay um, from those places? Um, or if it's a, a community supported agriculture scheme, you could go through a local regeneration organization or any kind of local environmental group and advertise through them that you're going to look into set up a csa get a public meeting together talk to people you know just just get really realistic discussions going as to are people going to buy this produce who's going to buy it and how much produce are they going to buy um, online surveys are great um, yeah I'll leave it there with market research because there's a lot, a lot more you could go into on that. Um, as far as workers go, so I'd say workers rather than land workers because in our case, you know, we've got land workers, but we've also got an accountant. We've got someone who deals with membership. We've got a schools officer. So, you know, there's different roles within the project depending on what kind of scale you're looking at. So, Going around through these, looking at who's going, who's going to actually run your project, who's going to be involved in your project. Obviously, there's going to be growers. Uh, that could be an individual with a number of employees, or it could be two or three growers growing cooperatively. cooperatively. Or you could be like, you know, 10, 15 growers growing cooperatively all on your own places. Uh, a bit like an example of that would be the Green Isle growers in the Dovey Valley in Machantleth. And there's a lot of examples of that in the States. Um, you could decide to team up with a whole bunch of growers and all produce different crops to feed into one box scheme or into one CSA. Another fundamental side of who works on our project, well, there's a few different areas. They're kind of all fairly fundamental. But I'd say when I started out, I kind of had to do everything as far as like membership, accountancy, obviously all the growing, volunteer management, educational work with schools and actually what I found was actually I did all of those jobs kind of okay but not as well as any of them could have been done and actually now we're in a position whereby we've got someone who does our accountancy our fundraising um, membership management we've got another person who deals with um, educational work and schools work and you know we could ideally have someone who's doing kind of more social projects and working with um sort of more needy groups so i'd say like i guess specializing roles becomes essential as you get bigger but not necessarily something you have to do immediately starting out but i'd say one thing you would do starting out is getting engaging volunteers like we have a lot of volunteers local regular volunteers who are again essential to how we work but we also work with EVS, the European Volunteer Scheme. And we have a couple of European volunteers who come and live with us for nine months a year. And then we have a UK trainee who lives with us for seven or eight months a year. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just another element to think about, trainees and volunteers. Um, and I'd say the other, the other side of that sort of doing educational work and social work 
working with schools, trainees, it makes you, it potentially gives you extra income and it makes the work a lot more interesting. I'm going to move on then to equipment, infrastructure and basic needs. So again, this all of these things I've kind of jotted down. They're all basic things that come to mind when starting up a project and the scale of how much you're going to have to invest in them or what you're going to yeah, it all it all comes down to scale. But I mean, basically, we've got within equipment, irrigation, hand tools, harvest trays, machinery. You can either go down the machinery route or you can choose to just use contractors. I know for us in the first year, we just had a tractor with a small cultivator and a mower. And then we used a contractor for everything else. And the contractors are generally pretty cheap. They're not always ready and available when you need them. So that's something worth thinking about. But it does mean your startup costs are a lot less. Um, infrastructure, I'd say um, storage for produce, pickup areas, polytunnels essential. You have to think about whether you're going to need fencing, whether you're going to need tracks or hard standing. And then other basic needs would be water supply, compost, manures seed compost, seed and trays, electricity, transport, toilets, compost toilets. And when I, when I basically just threw together this list to look at the costings, um, you know, you can start up very small scale. I'd say to five, I'd say if you had 5,000, you could basically get all the basic needs, all the basic bits of material and basic equipment you need to start generating a financially viable project but that's anything between 5,000 and sort of 30,000 you know depending on what you're willing to start with really and what you're willing to what you're willing to do to get going um, and then it, the, the whole thing kind of hinges around this question of scale so the scale thing is really depending on you know capacity of setup finances so, you know, what money have you actually got to start? Are you borrowing money? You know, are you going to be paying a lot, paying that money back? Can you get access to grants? Are you putting your own savings in? Um, then you've got the capacity of the worker or workers. You know, how many people are you working with? How experienced are they? How quick can they work? I think that is one essential thing um, within horticulture for it to be financially viable. I think you have to be very quick in what you do. And I know um, Lizzie, who I work with, is incredibly quick. And I've been really lucky that she was our first trainee the first year. Um, and she's now sort of, we're sort of working cooperatively as growers, but she is an incredibly fast worker. And that, that can make the real difference between make and break. Um, and I'd say also the ability to work well with others. We work with a lot of different people, um, different people coming and going. Um, so I'd say just the ability to chop and change with the people you work with and manage people effectively. Um, I've got about two and a half minutes left. So the other capacity of the market, again, is essential. You know, do you have a sizable population near you? What's it made up of? Is it made up of like cafes, restaurants, shops? Um, is there a wholesale outlet or one within reasonable distance? Is there competition? Are there other growers near you? How do they feel about it? Go and talk to them. And then the capacity of your land. Um, yeah, I really agreed with everything the dreaded gardener we were saying earlier, that ultimately, I think the best way we could grow food is grow it in a very diverse environment on a small scale with a lot of people growing small areas. But the position we're in at the moment is actually there's hardly, you know, we're kind of 1% or 2% of the population actually producing the food. And if we can try to do that in a way where we do maximise the biodiversity within it, then, you know, that's, I kind of feel like that's what we're aiming at at the moment. And also at the same time, trying to generate a reasonable income from that. So capacity of land, I think I mentioned earlier, the 250 square metres to maybe 350 square metres per household. And for us with the CSA, like you could say that each household could generate £700 a year. So we generate about 56000 a year from 126 households. Um, but that could be very different if you're looking at growing intensive salads, whereby 
Francesca, who works with us on a quarter of an acre, was recently making a thousand pounds a week, but she would only make a thousand pounds a week for like four weeks in the year. And then a lot of the year she would be making very little. Whereas we're making, we've got a regular income all year round with the system we're using. So, um, yeah, I'll just really briefly now, because there's only like a minute, minute left. Um, business planning, markets, um, who are you aiming at? People, businesses, wholesale. We've kind of covered that. Set up costs. You basically have to go through all those basic needs, work out exactly what you're going to need to spend to set up, um, and then look at your ongoing, your ongoing costs, wages, rent, water, seed repairs. Um, where will that investment come from? When and how much will workers get paid? We're on, as growers and as managers of the project with you know people we basically as growers and as the people basically who are doing our accounts and whatnot everyone's on 12.50 an hour so we're all on the same um and i think the last thing i was very briefly going to mention was just business structures which someone else would be much more in a better i'd, I'd contact like cooperative wales or someone like that to look at basically whether you should be a cic a limited company um, you know there's loads of different options for different types of business structures we've gone for a company limited by guarantee with not-for-profit aims because it allows us to do the kind of work we want to do effectively so that was like a fly through fly through thing but yeah hopefully that was helpful thank you brilliant Okay, thanks very much. Um, well, we are a couple of minutes um, ahead of ourselves. So in that sense, um, if anybody wants to have a careful think for a second, if there's um, a question there that might be useful for the whole group to hear, um, then uh, you can put your hand up in the old manual, old fashioned way and I will um, allow you to speak. <laughs> Does anyone have a question there about scaling up? Well, I do. Okay, there we go. We've got Nia Nibs Vaughan. If you'd like um, to unmute, there um, we go. Yeah, that was really useful. Thank you. This is something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, you kind of mentioned in terms of setup costs, anything from kind of five to 30K ish. Um, with property costs, you talk about um, looking at location. How would you consider a property in terms of ongoing financial? costs as well as location in terms of viability for selling what tips do you have say say again how would i consider so uh property property costs in terms of how much it costs how much it will cost ongoing in terms of council tax that kind of thing possible various costs there um also in terms of the market you'd want to consider because i'm looking at somewhere in the uk but yeah. i don't really know how i can balance the market viability versus the possible location risks you know coastal has risk of flooding but it has more people yeah yeah i think i think i mean land is almost impossibly like expensive to buy um unless you go to very out of the way places generally you go to an out of the way place where there's not much of a population and you can get a lot cheaper land um where we are at the moment we've got a really good population the land is totally unaffordable for us. So we've gone down a different route that we're renting one block from a private individual and then we're renting another block from the Ecological Land Cooperative. So, you know, there's always options at looking at renting and it's surprising when you start asking around, you know, a lot of farmers are interested in giving long-term contracts and diversifying what they're doing on their farms. So I'd say if you can afford to buy land, you know, that's fantastic. Um, but I think a lot of people can't. So what we're doing in our case is just basically renting where we can. And we just write that rental cost into our running costs and it just goes that way. But I think, yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Good. Okay. Well, um, we, yeah, the, there is some more, there's a number of routes, isn't there? There's people I know in the audience here who know about other route, uh, routes to supplement what Tom said about um, access to land and such. Maybe mm -hmm. they might want to put something in the chat. Uh, Tom is available for advice and support and his email there is in the chat function. So, um, you know, 
not just for scaling up, but all sorts of um, angles on, especially like the biodynamic rowing as well. So thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that. Cheers. Right. Um, okay, so we're on time. So I was wondering actually though, more about actually how, um, if you sew, uh, this is my, I'll get my question in. If you want to sew a hundred meter row of kale, as opposed to one bed of kale, um, what do you think is the sort of what's off the top of your head? Do you think my the first thing I'd have to adapt my thinking to change that? What, what? do you know what I mean? No, no. How do you mean? Well, say like at my normal house, I might grow a ten meter bed of kale. Yeah. But if I wanted to scale it up and grow um, enough to supply my clock or shop or something, and I wanted to have a hundred meters of kale in, what would be the main difference of going from a small bed to a long bed? Do you think? Well, I think, yeah, in a way, there's not a great difference because I know when we started up, you know, seven years ago, my experience was close to yours. It was growing fairly small scale in gardens and growing for like small groups of people. And I basically worked out originally with a spreadsheet. OK, actually, if we wanted to supply ourselves all year round, what mm. do we need to grow exactly? And I basically just pressed that times 50 to start the first year. Mm. And it kind of just expanded into it, it feels it feels I think the main thing is it feels overwhelming it feels at first like oh my god I can't possibly get my head around all this space and all these potential issues and problems but actually each time you take a step up to growing on a different level within a year actually or two years actually you're you know you're kind of ready to step up again if you need to it's, it's kind of just a conscious step up I think yeah no, I think that actually that sounds um, quite sensible, actually, because of thinking of other things where I've um, expanded myself. And then, yeah, before yeah. you know it, you're doing it, aren't you? And you're yeah, learning totally. it quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anna Monroe does ask, can you do no dig on a large scale? Um, I suggest you could check in with Charles Dowding's YouTube because he does it on a pretty large scale. And um, I believe yeah. in Pembrokeshire, there's a guy doing um, grains on um, a very large scale, but I've, I've didn't ever catch his name were you going to say something to that Tom well actually we had Charles Dowden come down and give a talk here because we were really interested as we were expanding to do things no dig but uh, you know having chatted with him in depth about it we kind of concluded that an acre or possibly up to a couple of acres is very doable no dig he says he's actually run five acres no dig but he found it was actually overwhelming and it didn't yeah. really work for him so it I feel like what we do is run all our polytunnels and whatnot, no dig, and any small areas we can. But actually, just because we're on about eight acres, we're not going to try and do no dig. Great. Thank you. I think that sounds um, very plausible, and I believe you. Right. Thank you very much. OK, so um, our last speaker now, uh, she's going to apparate with us through the internet because she couldn't actually be here tonight at the last minute. Something came up, but she's kindly um, recorded it. And our technical wizard, Del from the New Wales, is going to put her on in a minute. So you may or may not know about the Social Farms and Gardens Network. They put on brilliant things, courses and information, a lot of information free, a huge support. And in particular, they've got something called the Community Land Advisory Service that basically gives you top level um, advice on how to get land and how to get planning for things like polytunnels. And I believe the advice is free. So we've now got the... Um, the officer from Social Farms and Gardens here uh, filmed herself um, to tell us a bit more about the Community Land Advisory Service. And I think this is just a 10 minute presentation. So, um, yeah, I think she's going to explain it all now. Can you see her screen? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, my gosh. And while we're waiting for that, actually, I'll just say something because I spotted Kate Morgan there, um, who may or may not hear me. So uh, this is um, partly why I've, I had the inspiration to put this on is Kate Morgan down there. She's, they've got this Walwyn Village Hall group. And I'd just like to say thank you for them for giving me the idea to um, put on some practical top tips growing events. Okay. okay. If I press play now, Lucy starts in the top left hand corner immediately. Lovely. Thank you, Dior. Hello everyone, um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, say thank you for to Renew Wales for uh, providing me with this opportunity 
um, to, to speak with you this evening. I'm sorry I can't be live with you. Um, <clears throat> but I will provide my, my contact details at, at the end of this um, short 10 minutes sort of presentation. Um, if you, you know if you've got any queries or if you wish to wake up, take up the services of um, Community Land Advisory Service. Um, so this is me, um, I'm Lucy Taylor, um, Charter Town Planner and have worked for Social Farms and Gardens for the last seven and a half years, having worked previously at um, various planning departments, um, short stint in private sector planning consultancy and also managed helpline for Planning Aid Wales back in the day. Um, suffice to say, in the last seven and a half years, I've, I've dealt with um, hundreds of uh, community-led green space queries about accessing land, 90% um, of which, I would say, have an, an element of um, community food growing. Lots of issues tend to come up, um, obviously ranging from finding land, who owns land and, and how you go about finding that out, approaching landowners, whether they're public sector or private sector, um, negotiating lease um, or license terms to be on land, and um, looking at the risks and things to look out for before signing a land agreement, and of course um, getting planning permission for um, structures that you want to put on your community growing project being aware of that at, you know of, of what planning is required before acquiring sites uh, so today just going to focus on finding the right site and how to negotiate those all important terms to be on the land for your project So, the cliff edge. I have touched absolutely nothing. Yeah. Oh no. Um, so it's frozen, which it didn't when we practiced. So I don't know if anyone wants to um, has any I've advice. Been, I think I've been really silly. I think I've put the test one on, not the main one. Ah, do you want to have a minute to sort Thank that you. out, and I'll, I'll do a, a small um, break. Yeah, well, yeah, talk amongst yourselves, do apologise, sorry. Okay, well, while we're having um, the break for a second, I can just tell you something about the host groups, because um, probably most of you Hello. are in... Uh, my name is Sarah Trader, okay. I work for Social Farms and Gardens, managing the Community Land Advisory Service in Wales. <laughs> I've done for the last seven and a half years, having previously worked in, in planning departments. Um, before I go any further, I do want to just take this opportunity to thank uh, Renew Wales and partners for this opportunity and to allow me to do this um, remotely. Um, I did want to be there in person, but I, I'm unable to, so I've been recommended this new bit of software, which I'm hoping is going to work okay and is just as informative for you guys as, as I hope. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> Just moving forward as quickly as you can, because I know time is a bit short. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about today, something very much about um, finding the right site and negotiating uh, the terms of, of a land agreement and how to go about doing that. <clears throat> um, we want you to do the right things as early as possible before you, you present yourself to a local authority or a landowner. Um, so it, it, it's about doing those important things first and then helping you to negotiate with um, the landowner going forward. It is very important to be smart right from the start. Um, it might sound obvious, but um, there are lots of groups out there that, that have come to me over the years who have very big dreams and they are sort of one or two volunteers on their own and um, at that point I always suggest perhaps thinking about something small before you move on up to 
bigger things. Um, also think about not being too rigid um, with, with your sort of plans and consult with the community where you want to put the project, be inclusive and representative and show your worth to a potential landowner. The most successful sites are on the doorstep of the scheme um, and the smaller ones that, that sort of grow bigger uh, organically, if you like. Um, it won't surprise you to know that councils and landowners are risk averse um, and they will want you to show often in form of business plan or in writing um, that, that you are capable and organised and representative of, of that community. So <clears throat> just starting a search for some land, um, have a look around you. That's, you know, that might sound a bit obvious, but um, those are the sites that have the best chance of success, those ones that are in your community. Um, it might be a site you walk past every day and think that is a bit underused. Um, or if you don't know, have a look on Google Maps or on OS mapping, you can Google um, and see if there are bits of sort of land that might be a bit underused, go and explore and have a look to see if it's something you might want to take on. Do try to uh, think about planning as early as possible. Try to pick sites that were in, within the urban area because it is very difficult to get planning permission for structures in countryside locations. <coughs> um, think about obviously planning policy and the community land advisors can certainly help you with that. Uh, but also think about potential species on the site and whether those species are protected because if it's an underused site, then it's highly likely that there is some sort of um, species on the site. So you may need to speak to the local biodiversity or ecology officer in the council. Um, also talk to local, local people and your local councillor. Um, they may have ideas for potential sites, but also they need to be informed as early on as possible um, so that you're being inclusive and letting your local councillor know as soon as possible because they can be a big supporter of your scheme and point you in the right direction of the right people within the local authority. So that's really important. Also think about involving local businesses. It's in their interest as well to, to, to sort of be friendly with community projects. So um, get them involved as well. Um, if you haven't at this point, do engage the services of um, the, the Class Cymru programme. We are large government funded and um, yeah, those are my contact details, which I've, I'll provide at the end as well. The website is, I must say, um, quite up to date now and um, some, some useful new resources on it. So do take a look. Um, who owns the land? So um, you found a site that you like the look of, think you could do something fantastic with it, but you've got no idea who owns it. Um, first thing I would tend to do is speak to the local authority to the council and ask them if they own it. Your councillor could do this for you or certainly provide you with some contact names and details for you to ask the estate department. Um, in the meantime, you could ask some local people, local businesses. Um, if the council don't own the site, then you would best off them be looking at the, to go for, look, for a look at the land registry. Um, I've taken a screenshot of the land registry website because there's lots of companies out there that charge quite a bit more money than the land registry does for a basic search. If you've got an address of a property or a site, then the land registry is where to go. It'll cost you about four or five pounds to do a search. Um, but um, if you haven't got an address, then a commercial online company may be um, your last resort. Um, they tend to charge about 25 to 45 pounds to do a search for, for perhaps a, a field in the middle of nowhere we haven't got an address. Those are the types of instances where you might go to a company like that. Um, <clears throat> so getting your site and contacting the local authority, um, you need a location plan. So have a look on Google, do some screenshots. Um, Think about a rough layout of what the site might look like. Speak to your local community and what they might feel might be suitable on the, on the site. You do need a location plan and a rough layout to provide to the local authority or landowner. 
that's the starting point for the information that they require. Um, the local councillor as well will be helpful in terms of you starting a conversation with those relevant officers. The estates team are the ones that will be able to tell you if A, if they own it and B, if they're likely to want to speak to you about a community taking the site on. Um, bear in mind that some parks land like this one in Pont Cana, close to where I live, um, needs to remain open. Um, there's a statutory process to go through um, for other uses on parks land. So just bear that in mind that sometimes some large parks like this one needs to remain open and, and it, it's a no-go. Um, but um, once you've spoken to the state's team, do speak to the planning policy or planning um, uh, development control type team that deals with planning applications because they are very different um, entities to the uh, state's teams. They, you know, they, have, they have their own policies and it's important to check that that site is somewhere that, that you could be developed for a community project and is not going to be developed on for housing or um, in, in a particularly uh, bad area for flood risk, for instance. Next, I just wanted you to have a think about safety, soil and scent. Um, so what, what I mean by this is, um, you'll know this, some of this better than I will, um, you need sun to be able to grow food. Um, so if the site's particularly shaded, got lots of trees, then that might not be such a good site for a community food growing project. Check that the, site, the soil isn't contaminated, have a, um, an inquire about what previous uses were on the site, for instance. Um, and also think about whether it's a site that's going to be safe for volunteers to be working on and, and, and um, that a community project can thrive on. Um, do you need access to water? It, if you can't do rainwater harvesting to the extent that you need water, then um, have a think about you know, where you're going to get your water source from. Um, also think about access and whether you need parking. Um, we've touched on protected species and, and flood risk. Just think about some of these things as early as you can and keep engaging with neighbours and the community. Don't sort of drive us, team ahead, sort of two or three of you without speaking to everyone because the landowner and local authority will want to know that you've been speaking to them and they're part of the scheme. They've taken ownership of it. <clears throat> um, getting your site and negotiating, um, have a look at this web page, negotiating with landowners and complete the form, community project form on that web page. It's quite new, it's useful, it's the type of information that um, people within the state's department or the landowner will want to know. So have a look at that. Um, you may also be required to do a business or management plan. Um, this is, I've taken a screenshot of one that I found um, for up, up in Gwynedd actually. Um, a really good example of, of a business plan for an allotment, community allotment project. Um, you know, there's all sorts of information that's required in, um, in a business plan type um, document, such as how you're going to sustain the site going forward, where you're going to get your funding from, and these sorts of things. Then you need to think about perhaps the type of land agreement that would be suitable. If it's a very small project, a licence might be um, okay um, with a constituted group, um, but a lease may be more suitable where you're putting more money into the site, for instance, and it's a, a bigger scheme. So have a think about that and, and the community land advisory service can certainly help you with the right type of agreement. Don't get an agreement sort of type or form pushed upon you by the landowner. Um, and then moving on quickly to heads of terms. We do have a template document for heads of terms on our web page and that's the address. There's some important things you need to think about as a group and start populating this form. For instance, can you afford to pay rent? Do you need to have water on site? Who's going to pay for that water supply and usage? Um, you know, th th these are important things you need to think about early on and then present those things um, to the landowner and see if they can agree. 
um, one of the things, the biggest things really can be how long you want the, the agreement for. A funder may want at least 10, 15, 25 years. If your landowner isn't willing to give you the site for that long, um, or provide you an agreement with, for the site for that long, then it might be time to find another site. So it's important to think about these terms before you start going into the nitty gritty of a proper, you know, a full blown land agreement. Um, I'd love to sort of tell you more, um, but I think time is, is of the essence. Um, this again is our um, the information. Um, please feel free to, to drop me an email with queries, uh, follow ups from this, this presentation and um, if you need to use our services. The website is there as well, um, which is a really good up to date resource. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, been a, a pleasure to have this opportunity to tell you all about Community Land Advisory Service and um, hopefully speak to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> wow, there we go. So I hope you managed to catch that for, and it's inspired anyone to think tons of help out there to get the legalities going, tons of, if you want to set up a community growing space. Um, well, I nearly started talking to Lucy, but as she's in North Wales at the moment, doing something important, it'd be impossible to speak to her. So that's the end of our presentations for now. I'd just like to tell you something about the host groups, even though there's 70 people that book tickets aren't here, there's just the 20 odd of us. And, um, and then if anyone wants to stay on, we can just have an informal sharing of top tips and gardening things just for say quarter for now afterwards. Um, but I would just like to say a couple of things about the hosts. So Renew Wales, as you may or may not know, if you're a community group in any way, you don't have to be particularly constituted, you just have to be a group of people. Um, we provide a lot of help if you'd like to take action on climate or ecological issues and resilience. Uh, we've got a brilliant pool of mentors to help you on all topics from sustainable housing, food, well-being, food growing, the whole lot. Um, and it is free and it's a relatively easy sign up process. So if you've got any ideas and you'd like some help, please contact Renew Wales. I'll say something about Transition Broke Wine. As most of you might know, they've done amazing things over the last 12 years in down here in Fishguard. And, um, but now nearly all the core group are in their 70s. And although we've got a lot of supporters, we could really do with some more core group if um, we're going to take TBG forward. So if anyone would think that they live in quite wide area around Fishguard, say up to Newport, down to St. David's, that sort of zone. If you think you'd like to get involved with TBG, you know, they've set up allotments and many things in the past. Then please um, contact through the email or contact me if you'd like to join our core group or help. Um, I'm going to say the best class. Another one, Paramaithi Sabendro Permaculture Group. Uh, we go around once a month and go and help at people's places. So whether that's like today, we've been lime washing someone's cottage and putting up a polytunnel, or um, sometimes we just share ideas and company to build that sort of type of resilience that Kim was really talking about in ourselves as people at these difficult times. So anyone could have a garden. You don't have to be a permaculturalist. We'll come and help between 10 and 50 of us on a Sunday and we call them helping hounds days and we're really open to um, people joining in so there's our thing in the chat and finally and perhaps most um, poignantly is a new group in Pembrokeshire called Fanoni Community Resilience it's covering northeast Pembrokeshire over quite a wide area it's got some very experienced people in its core group and a couple of months ago they had a people's assembly of over 70 people um, and it went very well and from that they've made action groups and they particularly have an action group to get food growing it's connected in with all sorts of other things but they also would really appreciate anyone who actually wants to get stuff going there's already a core team holding it all together and and um, yeah, they're having action group meetings on a variety of topics, but in particular the food group. So they're also, that's there. You can find them on Facebook, same as you can find a number of our speakers. So that's Fanoni Community Resilience for North East Pembrokeshire. So that's my groups. I think I've managed to remember to say everything I was supposed to say, <laughs> even though my brain normally stops at seven o'clock. Um, and thank you, Delith, as well there for holding it all together. 
on the tech side. So um, yeah, we're good. Work. And so um, if you'd like to disapparate now, um, all right. So uh, Vicky, would you like to say something about Pembrokeshire Roy Dry projects? Then you might explain it better than me. Yeah. Okay. Just it was also born out of. Um, concerned about food and growing food which was born out of um, the COVID lockdown and um, so we did form a network a resilience network for the whole of the county which is expanding beyond the county a bit now and it's although the theme is resilience the main focus is food and uh, land um, accessing land and one of the things that came out of the big assemblies the big zooms that we me and Anna initiated in which other people put on like the Extinction Rebellion Cardigan put on a huge one for, on food and farming with 156 people and it was a very uh, amazing event all round but one of the things that came out of all of them was the need for more land for community growing so we're looking for land in Pembrokeshire now um, to either asset transfer or to buy to enable people to produce more food and also hoping to look after the allotments of Pembrokeshire because the council is suggesting we apply to manage them. They're not well managed at the moment. And hugely sh under huge waiting lists, um, waiting ridiculous numbers of years and not particularly well looked after allotments. So there's a lot of work to do. So that's probably do. So um, you can find that uh, Lloyd Wyth um, projects uh, on Facebook. Yeah, that's an efficient way to mm -hmm. find you. Okay, so um, please feel free to disapparate if you're a Harry Potter fan, you know what I mean. And um, <laughs> if anyone wants to stay um, for 15 minutes and we have a chat, uh, please do. So, and thank you all for coming. Okay, looks like people are staying, you're hungry. <laughs> so what I was going to suggest is we went into um, small groups of three to five and just shared our own had a real think about of all the years we've been around gardens or nature what is the best thing we've learned that we'd like to pass on and i thought if we just had a go around and shared each thing so can you just put your hands up do you want to go in a small room or do you want to stay in this big room so hands up for small room oh hands up for big room <laughs> there we are we were staying in the big room. only for Jasmine, there's only 15 people left now, so if you do want to divide them, that's quite a nice figure, but up to you. Okay. All right. Well, I think the, um, the masses have spoken. They want to stay together. They're in polyculture. We're in polyculture companion planting mode. Um, so as long as you haven't got loads of background noise on in the background, I suppose we could unmute, but just take a moment then to think, is there something that you've seen or you've heard that you think is a really good tip that you'd like to share here in a concise and sensible way, please. And, um, or if you don't have any tip you'd like to share, perhaps you might have a burning question. And then between us here, I'm sure we'll be absolutely able to deal with that. So um, I'd like to share one. I had a patch of um, wild marjoram growing and it was really big and um, See, I was growing cabbages and all my neighbours were had their cabbages decimated with um, the white butterfly. And I actually did observe very effectively uh, the butterflies all over the marjoram and not they didn't take my cabbages. And in general, with a few other pests as well, I have seen that, especially with the umbelliferae flowers, like the yarrows and stuff. If you've got them growing nearby, that's my top tip. Have umbelliferae flowers growing near your vegetable crops. So, who would like to go next? Del, have you got anything that, from your garden? Oh my gosh, that's interesting actually. Um, or burning question. No, it's, it's funny, we moved house um, July last year and we're intending to just observe this year. It's, it's quite a large garden, but there's a big huge oak tree and two other trees in the middle of it, so there's a lot of shade. So we were fully intending to just observe this year and see how much sun is going to come in, trim off a few branches here and there. And then lockdown happened and we decided that we would <laughs> do a, bit, a, a little veg plot. And um, basically we were in the garden for the first three weeks, maybe four weeks of lockdown because the weather was so nice. So my husband dug right across the bottom patch of the garden, which I don't think had been turned for a number of years. 
Um, we planted potatoes, carrots, peas, lettuce. Um, I've had a decent crop of all of those, and then we had a herb bed. There was um, there was a little plot of land with a nice little stone wall around it, so we just planted some new herbs, and those have gone from strength to strength. And funny you mentioned marjoram because that's what I was looking at earlier, mm -hmm. thinking, hmm, how bushy does this get, and does this die yes. down in the winter? I don't know how many. How many do most herbs die down completely in the winter? Will some keep going? Or yeah. Pretty much, uh, apart from things like the rosemary and the lavender, the yeah, and mm -hmm. some people like you know you can keep chopping them quite a lot through the year, and but as long as you give them a chance to flower, uh, see so either of our um, I don't know how many of the experts we've got remaining. Do you want to say anything about herbs and chopping or letting them go over winter? I think uh, yeah. there, there are there are many hardy ones. Um, some can be a bit borderline. It depends on how cold the winter gets. In many ways, um, if you're coastal, you've got a better chance, I would say, of uh, maintaining things over the winter. Um, but rosemary is generally fine. Salvias, sages, they're generally fine. Um, there are uh, you know, various ones. You you could argue if they're herbs or winter salads. Um, but you can keep some things going uh, with the use of a bit of fleece or if you can grow in protection such as a polytunnel or a greenhouse um, you can have several things um, surviving that way as well. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, who else then? Which I pick people? I could... Um... Uh, okay, and I can see Helena Reese there, she's ready to go as well. Oh yeah? Oh, no, <laughs> it's like being at a tea junction, isn't it? Who's going to go? All right, let's let ladies first in the good old fashioned way, and then we'll hear from Tom next. I was only going to ask I've got two greenhouses at the moment, and I want to actually go up for a polytunnel. But then the expense of that, I'm wondering, is it really worth it for two people? Mm, wow, that that's kind of money, doesn't it? <laughs> it depends what you, uh, how much you like, because some, you know, you can never have too much undercover space, some gardeners say, don't they? So you broke up a bit. Did you say you've got yeah. two greenhouses and you're wondering whether to put up a poly as well? Kevin. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. There's only two of us here. Well, do you manage to eat everything you grow in the greenhouses already? I sort of get fed up of it before I ah. eat it, really. Ah, well, then I don't know, but I suppose if you've got the capacity to do it, then you could be producing some significant amount of surplus. If you fancy a bit of go at, you know, supplying a shop or chucking it out, you know, putting it on a little table. Uh, do you see, have any thoughts on that, Tom? I Yeah, I would definitely put up more covered space definitely <laughs> even if it means you can just go out and sit out there on a cold winter's day when there's you know just have a bit of space to sit inside and have a bit of sun warmth I mm -hmm. yeah I'd be all up for putting up more cover I um I was basically just gonna say like I'm just like amazed still that like, every week when we harvest at the incredible productivity of the earth that actually do you know, like I, I was amazed the first year, like I remember the first week when we filled up a van load of produce for 50 households from our little garden. And now we're filling up like multiple trailer loads to take them to the pickup point every week for 126 households. And you know, that goes on like every week of the year for seven years. And I kind of see, you know, things fluctuate and there's good, good crops and bad crops with the seasons. But overall, I'm just amazed at how the productivity actually seems to be endless when you look after the soil. Yeah, so yeah, that, that was my point really. It's just, Thank I just, you. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. That's made me feel all cheerful. And um, <laughs> oh, Helena is making me feel cheerful too. But I think yeah, I think if, if you've got you know the energy and um, if you you know there's things like the there's a number of other. You know, it depends what your creative idea is as well, isn't it? Like there's quite a lot of. I don't know. Maybe you've got someone around who would really benefit from having their own bit of growing space and you could get them managing the tunnel or something. Yeah, actually, yeah, good idea. Yeah, 
If I lived on your street, I'd be there like a shop. So, <laughs> um, Vicky's got one. What have you got, Vicky? Well, it's more just because I'm really concerned and excited about the scaling up and having more enterprises like Tom's everywhere and wondering what the barriers are. I mean, I can imagine, but I wonder what you feel are the biggest barriers that could be moved. Is it getting people to shift from supermarket customers, uh, leave the supermarket and buy local, or is it planning, or is it the cost of land, or is it finding the people to do the work and you're keen on becoming gardeners? I think, it's, I think it's um, access to land is the key one, I would say at the moment. I feel like actually there's loads of young people trained up and skilled up who are willing to produce food. And I think markets wise, we're finding, you know, we've got, we, we're supplying 126 households. We've got almost 100 households on a waiting list. We've helped a second CSA to set up just a few miles down the road. She's got another 60 members and a waiting list straight away. Wow. Uh, so it seems to me like the, the problem is, I think the whole COVID thing was a hugely positive impact for us. We suddenly, we already had a bit of a waiting list, but it's kind of gone crazy now that people really value local produce. Um, but yeah, I'd say the main thing is access to land and also people realising that it is possible in the right circumstances to generate an income and actually have like a, a good livelihood from growing food. Um, but the other side of it is we're currently, you know, we, where we are in Swansea, we're like Swansea East and Swansea West are two very different parts of the, of Wales. Like Swansea East is very impoverished. Some of the poorest sort of households in Wales, Swansea West, you could say where we are, are some of the most well off parts of Wales. Um, and we've kind of got a mixture. I'd say the majority of our members buying produce from us are pretty well off. You know, we have got people who haven't got jobs as well, but we're currently trying to set up a project in Swansea East. And that's like proving to be firstly, like really difficult to find land. Um, we think we've got interest from surveys, but actually it's a very different, you know, that, that culture of Swansea East they're just not used to actually eating fresh produce. So I'd say that's in a sense in a lot of parts of Wales, you know, it's, it's just that history of like what we eat and how we prepare food that people just don't know about it. So that's going to be a block for us as well going forward. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, and I'd like the vegetable, you know, there's a couple of veg box schemes down near me and um, one of them got 200 on its waiting list. So yeah, if anyone's got the energy, it's certainly time, isn't it? Well, to get going with it. Um, and I was interested, Tom, also that yours, that, that's often when I've been speaking to edible horticulturalists over this year, one of the problems is often finding the money for staffing. But you said that you actually you had good negotiations with the county council, didn't you? And, and NRW that actually helped you with staffing costs as well. So yeah, the more yeah. we share this information, then yeah, what well, the whole the whole funding for setup costs? Yeah, we've been we've been really lucky with that. Or oh, well, I guess more than I guess more so than lucky, we've actually put a lot of work into making that happen as well. Yeah. Um, but we made a lot of contacts initially with the rural development program in the local council um, and they really liked what we were doing <clears throat> and they funded us for for a good few years and then they've also funded the setup of another project because one of their one of their reasons for funding us was that they wanted to see that what we could do we could duplicate so when we proved that actually we could take one of our trainees and she could set up a project they funded her for three years to set up hers as well which is great and then, yeah, Natural Resources Wales, we've sort of developed a relationship with them and they're really helpful. Um, you know, I think all these organisations, they see the value of connecting people to local food and they see all the positive spin-offs that come out of it. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, they, they want to help. So I think it's just a matter of getting in there. Um, yeah, Lu I was saying actually Lucy was really good for that. It's a shame she wasn't here in person because when we started out, we had some planning issues. And the fact that Lucy used to be a planner and she knew some of the planners in Swansea Council, we suddenly had this person who would come and sit down and talk. So we were on an equal level with the people in the council. And I think anywhere where you can make those connections and talk on equal footings <laughs> with people in those apparently like places of um, authority, you know, it gives you real inroads to moving forwards. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, have any of the quiet people, have any of you got a question you'd like to ask or a top tip you'd like to share? Yeah, Diana, are you part of Wellwyn Group, who was my inspiration? You have to unmute. No, she's not, but she's smiling. Okay. Let's let's somehow signal to Diana that she has to turn her microphone on. The classic. Down in the left corner. Is that there it? we are. Yeah, thank Am you. I, Have you got a no. topic or, or a question? I don't, but there's something peculiar about my, yeah? Can you hear me now? Yeah. No? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, right. This is a silly, this might sound a really silly question. Brilliant. But, you know, some plants um, take more of something out of the soil and others put other, put something in the soil. Is the way for putting them together that can do the other? <laughs> Say that last bit again because I it went all squiggly. The last sentence. Is there something is, we is there is there um a possibility of plant putting plants together that kind of feed each other mm. you know that yeah. what one puts out the other needs is that a silly question no, <laughs> that's a good that's question. Been my um, for a long time <laughs> yeah no it's good I've, I've got a sort of amateurish answer do you um dreaded one do you want to say anything about that about because that ties in with your talk a bit yeah well it's um yeah, the, the classic one of a, a crop rotation in a four bed sense would be starting off with something like um, potatoes, uh, where you can feed the land at that point. Then the suggestion would be to grow legumes the following year, because they can still take that. Oh, so you do in succession like that, you wouldn't... Yeah, yeah, well, in a, over right. a year's yeah. growing period. Yes, I was just wondering whether you could plant things next to each other. Well, I mean, that oh. thing of using the wild plants, they all dynamically accumulate minerals. So if you could find a way to, um, you know, have that around, um, like using the legumes, mm. like, you know, that way. But if you're talking about directly in, in with it, um, I mean, they will compete with yes. fresh up to a point, but... The things like magnet, you know, um, for example, dandelions, they bring magnesium up for the plants. So, oh, does, does yes. Camille from Thimble want to say something on this? Is that why you're waggling? I don't know if that boy down there is trying to speak, but. Um, Hi, it's Kev actually. How are you doing? Um, I uh, was going to say the, uh, the old favourite is the Three Sisters, the corn, beans. So the corn, the beans, and the tuber, uh, or corn, beans, and squash. So the beans give um, food to the um, corn, which is quite hungry. And I'm talking like basic nutrients rather than um, trace elements. But uh, I'm sure probably that goes on as well. But um, yeah, the classic is the three sisters. So you put uh, the beans will grow up the corn and um, the squash grows at the base. They both benefit from nitrogen fixing from the beans and the squash uh, covers the ground, give a good ground cover, keep the moisture in, keep the weeds depressed. Um, thank you. I think there are lots thank of you, thank combinations. You. Uh, yeah. Is there anywhere I can find you? all these combinations because um, normally, like Bob Flowerdew's compon companion gardening book, it's 20 years old now, but you know, do you remember Bob Flowerdew from television? I do, yes. I think, that's, I think that's a really lovely book that um, does, you know, it combines a lot of what our speakers have been saying, putting the nature first, but at the same time getting that fertility. Um, does anyone agree with me on that? Like Bob, old Bob's book? Little bit of little bit of um, no, Malcolm's looking down, so so is Tom. So maybe it's not the best choice, but uh, I don't know. Oh I think to move from <laughs> best you could gardening to um, polyculture gardening, it's just good, it's easy to understand as well. Mm. I, I find with many aspects of companion planting, when I've tried to look 
um, and do a bit of research on it, you go to one place and it will say, this love's growing with this, and you go somewhere else and it says, all these two really hate each other. Yeah. So it, oh, it, yeah. It's just <laughs> all over the shop. Trial and error, isn't it? But it, it's yeah. sort of that, that's why I, uh, one of the angles I like to come from is personal experience. You know, watch yeah. and see what goes on. Most people don't seem to trust their own experience anymore. If they haven't read it in a book, they don't believe it. But whatever you see going on, you know, just play. <laughs> it, it's all playtime. This is it's all playtime. Yeah. Play about different things. Lovely but way of looking at what it. happens and see <laughs> what works and what doesn't. Uh, and then trust in your own experience of that. I think, yeah. Um, I really, really agree with that. Mm. We've, we've come to doubt ourselves in this professionalism obsessive world. And we know all of our, probably only one or two generations back, all of us had farming ancestry, you know, all my family were peasant farmers. So it's in us, isn't it? It's in our gene pool. So let's uh, trust ourselves and, and observe. So is that Nina with your hand up there? Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, nearly. Okay, well. um, I was just wondering with the, with the three sisters, you, do you plant them all at the same time or do you have to start one, get it at a certain height and then start the other one or, yeah? The uh, running order is probably the corn planted up first to get, get, let it get ahead so it's not smothered by the beans and then the, uh, follow with the beans and then the squash. Um, so um, get your corn out quite a bit quite early, as soon as the, there's no risk more of frost, you could um, start it off indoors. Uh, popular thing is in toilet tubes, you're not too worried about what might be contained in them or just make sure they're not you know, too perfumey or painted or anything. Um, and um, yeah, then followed by the beans and the, the squash doesn't necessarily, I find squash didn't um, do too well in being put out in cooler weather, so I did to leave them a bit later anyway. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's one I've, I've heard about with the three sisters. It, it's um, very often in this country, it's not warm enough, early enough for long enough to get the sweet corn going, because that's the key thing. Uh, is getting the sweet corn going so uh, as was said there if you can start it off early indoors and grow it on in warmth so that when you plant it out it's quite large already um, there's a far better chance of success but it's, it, that's one of the keys in this country it's just generally not warm enough to yeah. really push the sweet corn on yeah good point yeah because it's often cited in books isn't it and people get demoralized and then that's probably exactly you guys have just put hit it on the head um I, um, did, would Mary or Nia, would either of you like to ask something? Yeah, Nia will go for it. You look like you're spinning a bobbin there. Yes, I don't have anything to ask. I was just going to say, wool is really good on the garden. I love wool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Do you use it as a, as a mulch or something? Yeah, so I wash it off um, using rainwater and then the, all the muck that I wash off goes on as basically very, very fertile water and you can use the wool as uh, basically just to closh things when it's cold. Also, it composts down really well. So wool is very good for you. Brilliant top tip, Nia. Yeah, thank you. That's a great one. And um, if any of you live in a rural area, which probably is all of us, uh, then, um, you know, my, my neighbouring farmer, he burns his fleeces because he can't get oh. a price for them. So, you know, wool is around. Although wool jumpers are very expensive, wool is, um, is around. One of the things we uh, in Australia and New Zealand where they use dags, which I never knew, like, you know, dag is like an insult, but it's yeah. like it's basically just all the pooey bits shaped from around the sheep's bum. And actually, that was amazing. You know, that was like used all the time for composting fruit trees and like small shrubs. And I don't, I've never seen it used in this country, but that was like, yeah, I'm surprised there's not more of it around. Good point, because it's, it looks filthy, doesn't it? sheep's bum dags but it's very fertile <laughs> yeah yeah at the moment especially if you can support wool farmers by buying fleeces for cheap it's they need it right now because the wool industry is a bit screwed mm. good point yeah someone could make a little business of that or probably has and um, Malcolm were you gonna were you trying to say something we kept busting you out yeah someone had uh, uh, there was a farm I used to work at um, and they, uh, as part of an organic farm, 
Uh, they have sheep on the land. Uh, and what they've started doing now is all of their fleeces go into their compost. Oh, yeah. Um, but also up at Havod, we've not <clears throat> really looked at it in much detail as yet. But one of the things we have talked about trying to do to go more towards a no dig, but then you've got to have a, a huge amount of organic matter to do that. Uh, one of the ways we thought to try and solve that would be sheep's wool and bracken compost. Yeah. And looking oh, into yeah. making that and trying to find out good recipes for that. Because there's loads of bracken on the estate, it really is. Um, and it's probably the, the one of the things I'm not sure about is when's the best time to cut the bracken. Because it's trying to think, as, um, as we heard earlier on about composting, it's all about the browns and the greens. So I'm not entirely sure what the sheep's wool is classed as, but then that would govern what time you cut the bracken. Do you want it in its green state or do you want it in its brown state later? That's yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay, Bob, have you got an answer? Yeah, there's a, there was, there's a guy up north that does exactly that. Um, and I, he was mowing it in a green state. Um, okay. Yeah, and they, he ended up getting lots of other farmers involved and they now, there's a compost that's now yeah. part of yeah it's up north somewhere in england oh is that is that dalefoot maybe yeah dalefoot compost they do a cheap swell and bracken mixes that they are small bags and they're very expensive yeah um, yeah, so we'd rather, yeah, if we can look into that ourselves and if um, sheep's wool is keratin, if it, I don't know if it's if it's a protein, then it would it probably it would be a night it would come under the green, wouldn't it? In a way, because it'd be nitrogen rich. But ooh. if you if you're cutting the bracken to reduce the bracken, then you do it when the ponds are just finished unfurling. I've, I've been down. Okay, yeah. So if it, if we want to get that multiple function permaculture benefit out of it, there you go. I got the word in once. So yeah. Um, I was going to say the same thing, actually, because it's something we're looking into. We've got like a thousand acres of a lot of bracken just within like 500 metres of the field. Um, and we're chatting with the, the, the Common Association and they're really keen for us to come and take as much bracken as possible. But they want us to take it exactly like you said, when, when it's green and it's early in spring, because they want the grass, they don't want the bracken. So that's what we're going to do. But then I've been speaking to a farmer in Brecon who harvests it all well now he was harvesting it last week and he uses it for animal bedding and then obviously the animal bedding is then instant manure afterwards so, yeah yeah you just got to be a bit careful with bracken has though haven't you about has it spores it then as well spores. yes it can be carcinogenic so you got to be a bit careful there uh, but also um uh, i did my horticultural qualifications many years ago in part of margan park and speaking to one of the rangers there he said he had this absolute beast of a lawnmower and he just used to plough through bracken with it. Um, and over a number of years, he reclaimed huge areas back to grass. It's just, again, it, with these sort of pernicious things, if you want to destroy them, keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, you will weaken it in the end. Um, like three it's, times as a minimum. Yeah. And with, uh, I've heard with stinging nettles, why well, do you want to get rid of all the stinging nettles? I don't know. Um, <laughs> But uh, if you can do them three cuts a year, and after three years, apparently that exhausts the root. That's what they say. Cut, too, so, just as it's yeah. coming towards flowering, so then it's it's maximum energy output. And if you cut it then, you can get three cuts in the year, and three years later it's gone, apparently. apparently. We will let you know. I'm sure we'll all feed in on this one. Um, right, it's very it's getting quite late now, but I just want to check with Mary there, Mary Carrington, who I think has come from the Wildwind Vegetable Group and uh, who was the inspiration for this idea. Um, and unfortunately, even though I'm their coordinator, I haven't been able to meet them this year because of the coronavirus, but you... So is there anything you'd like to add in, Mary, before we go? Yeah, well, she's finding her buttons. And um, there we go, oh, nearly. It's a pity we're not all in a room together, but then at least after this, we can go and drink wine and tea and just fall into our beds rather than having to drive home. Oh no, she can't do it. Okay, well, thank you for coming, Mary. <laughs> we, love, we love you, even though we don't know you. So, um, all right, thank you everybody. It's really lovely to see new faces and please do think about putting on, getting someone with, you know, anyone in your community who's actually knows anything about gardening at all. Oh, here she is. Go for it, Mary. It's been very, very interesting, thank you. Yeah. yeah, do you would you like um to share anything else? 
<laughs> Does anybody with the composting ever just dig dig it in? Or, you know, the the fresh compost. Yeah. My exactly. mother always used to dig, have a trench going all the time, yeah. and put all the vegetable waste in it and turn it over all the time. Yes. Do I've people do that nowadays? I've, I've seen it successful like that, but with putting in something in to accelerate it, like nettle juice or something that gets it going quicker. Do you, Malcolm, have you got a thought on that, putting in the fresh compost and turning it into the beds? Um, myself here, when I use compost, um, I'll generally spread it on the surface um, uh, as in kind of as if you're mulching. And then I would do what's known as minimum cultivation, minimum tillage. Um, it's, it's generally thought these days, really, that turning the soil is really, really bad for it. Um, very uh, massive amounts um, can interfere, as uh, Kim said earlier, with the mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which are very, very important organism for many of our plants. Um, so it's more uh, just, I, I put the fork in, I lean back on it a little bit, uh, and so you're breaking up and allowing air in but you're not turning anything because the, the soil, it's a whole community down there. So the least, if you mix it all up, it's got to take time to reestablish itself again. So yeah. just, I find the minimum tillage aspect, it just mixes it in a little bit if I spread it on the surface first. Um, so it, it gets down to a degree. And then when you're planting things or whatever, um, you know, it mixes in then as well. Um, but it's, you know, it's always useful on the surface because that means the worms will come up for it. And, you know, it'll disappear in no time at all, really. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I once had someone invade my community garden. I was in near Cardiff and they put in the compost all under the beds. But they did put this stuff called Bokashi on, which is uh, like a fermented microorganisms. And um, so they did turn the soil and put it in. But I, we actually had tomatoes this week. <laughs> They were amazing, but it was either that or the rat's nest that was under the bed, the dead rats, <laughs> one or the other. But so I have seen the compost working quite well at that. Okay, Pobble, um, lovely to see you all. Uh, get in touch, start your own talks or whatever. And um, thanks very much for coming. And spend thank time. you, Jasmine. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Dennis, as well. Thank yeah. yeah, thank you both for all your uh, all your work in getting this. Yeah, to... yeah, good, good one, Malcolm. Um, hopefully, um. We meet in person sometime. You know, you've seen Nina Weatherhead here. She's who she was your fan. She's who got me to Kai. 